Yeah, thank you very much for having me. I'm excited to do this. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Let's. Uh, I think we should just dig right in here. This idea of yeah. metabolic flexibility, this concept. Uh, you are you're an expert in this. So can you give us a bit of a foundation or some of the basics around uh, what this really means? Yeah. So I think especially in the the fitness and even the medicine world, kind of people tend to argue about the the two main sources of fuel. So if we keep it simple, which are just uh, carbohydrates and fat. And you know, in the past, I think higher carbohydrate diets were more popular than what they are now. And you know, now people tend to swing much more to the you know higher fat diet. Especially there's a lot of stuff around ketogenic diets, which are very high fat, uh, very low carbohydrate, kind of lowish to moderate protein, depending on whose standards you use. And with metabolic flexibility, it's saying that both of them are actually super important. It just depends upon what you're actually doing. So it's kind of making sure you're using the right fuel at the right time. So if you're going to weight train or you're going to do some high intensity intervals, or CrossFit or things of that nature, you definitely want to be able to using carbohydrates as best that you can. Uh, if you can't, your performance is definitely going to tank. Uh, vice versa, if you're you know sitting around like we are doing a, a podcast or just kind of hanging out or going for low intensity exercise, walking around, you actually want most of those activities to be fueled from fat, not necessarily carbohydrates. So it depends upon the intensity and depends upon what exactly you're doing should determine what fuel is going to be best. And then the second part is how fast can you transition from one to the next. So that would be kind of the basic parts of metabolic flexibility. And so if we, if we dive into that there or touch base a little bit deeper on this idea of, um, you know, overweight, obese clients versus more athletic clients, because I know sure. people try to understand things and they tend to, whether they realize it or not, kind of put things into a black or white category of carbs, good carbs, bad, or yeah. vice versa. So how does, let's say we have an obese client in front of us. Uh, what are their problems with this metabolic flexibility? Where are their areas of concern and how can we improve that metabolic flexibility? Yeah, for most people who are overweight, and again, this is a, a generalization, you can get into the whole, you know, some people have more metabolic issues or, or not, but we do know that if you follow overweight people long enough, that they do de develop metabolic issues. Um, so most of them you could kind of classify as being more on the metabolically inflexible spectrum. So if you imagine we've got a spectrum with on the left-hand side, we've got the use of fat. And on the right-hand side, we have the use of carbohydrate. They tend to generally drift more towards the right. They tend to drift more towards staying in that uh, using carbohydrates all the time. And this is the very same state that uh, type 2 diabetics end up into. So if you look at just sort of metabolic health, and we'll kind of lump both of those together for now for the sake of simplicity, that they're... Everybody knows that they have problems with carbohydrate use, um, but over time what happens is they actually have problems with the use of fat. So what happens is due to the disease process, they become less and less sensitive to insulin. So insulin can be better thought of as a fuel selector switch, which I believe I stole that from Dr. Jeff Volick. Awesome. So when insulin is high, it's pushing your body to primarily use more carbohydrates. When insulin is low, it's primarily pushing your body to use more fat. And if you think about what happens in sort of, let's say, a type 2 diabetic or someone who's overweight and headed down that pathway, their body says, oh, okay, we've got blood glucose kind of running around. We have to make sure that this doesn't get too high. So we're going to do everything possible in order to make sure that doesn't happen. So the body is wired to survive. So it says, okay, even if we're less insulin resistant, ooh, we can fix that. We'll just keep jacking out more and more and more insulin, right? We'll kind of try to override that signal, so to speak. But what happens with that as the insulin level gets higher and higher, it's pushing the body to try to use more carbohydrates. <clears throat> it's trying to clear more, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, glucose out of the bloodstream. What happens as sort of a side effect of that is that insulin is always higher and higher, so it's actually moving away from shifting down to use fat as a fuel source. And if you hook these people up in the lab or you do different types of measures, uh, what you'll see is that even at low intensity exercise or even just resting, 
a lot of times they're burning mostly carbohydrates and that they've sort of lost that ability now to use fat. And because of, say, a type 2 diabetic and the disease process there, they're even not able to fully use carbohydrates quite as well as they could. So they're getting kind of squished from the right end of the spectrum, and they're getting kind of squished from the left end of the spectrum. So they're becoming very metabolically inflexible. And a lot of the, the newer research now is actually looking more at maybe if we can somehow upregulate the use of fat as a fuel source maybe in these populations, that maybe that will actually start uh, benefiting them. So we're trying to get a little bit more away from just being uh, hyper-focused on carbohydrates and carbohydrate metabolism in that group of patients now, too. That's perfect. I mean, for doctors or practitioners, um, you know, trainers at home listening, I mean, this is where you typically get, you know, very overweight, obese clients. They wake up, they yeah. have a bowl of cereal, glass of orange juice. Um, you know, their total caloric intake might look okay or even low compared to their size, but, you know, speak to a little bit of that in terms of, you know, the, the high carbohydrate breakfast and even the constant snacking through the day, what that would do for this person who's, in, you know, metabolically inflexible. Yeah, they get kind of stuck in a trap because their body is now being more wired to carbohydrate use and most of them appear to have less sensitivity to drops in glucose also and as time goes on, the glucose and insulin ratios get kind of hosed up too. So one of the studies I did at the U of M, which was actually never published, but I got farmed out to the, the epi department for a year and a half. When they were following up an uh, epi study they did with an actual a more randomized controlled trial. And the short version of all of that was that I spent a whole bunch of time looking at uh, borderline uh, type 2 diabetics. They were overweight, had some metabolic issues, but didn't quite meet the classic criteria. And we're looking at exercise, movement, and we had insulin, and we had blood glucose on these people resting and during exercise. And what's fascinating is if you just kind of scan down the list and you only looked at their blood glucose, some of them were really high, but a couple of them were not too bad off, you know, 110, 105. You know, they're definitely on the higher side, but, you know, they weren't having these extreme excursions. Yeah. But then you slid over and you looked at their insulin level. Uh, one poor guy, his insulin levels were sky high, even though his blood glucose was only about 110. So high, but not you know extreme. And if you only took a snapshot of blood glucose and you didn't know the history or anything else, you'd go, hmm, he's not doing too bad. But you look at how high the insulin level is in order to accomplish that, and you're thinking, oh man, this guy's you know in a world of hurt. So if you take someone like that and then you say, okay, now their main diet is going to be carbohydrates from when they get up. They're not going to allow their insulin levels to ever go back down. You're just sort of exacerbating uh, that problem because you're keeping insulin much higher and they, they get a little bit stuck in that area too because they paradoxically feel a little bit better in that, um, but long term they're actually just hammering that side a little bit uh, too much. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, in a clinical setting, how we, you know, doctors use, you know, fasting blood glucose as, as a measure of, of of blood sugar control and, and yeah. HA1Cs as a three month average of, of blood sugar control. Yet, you know, like you're mentioning here, behind the scenes, this actual early predictor uh, of insulin is something that we actually don't even test for until people become really dysfunctional, pre diabetic or diabetic, kind of like waiting until all the wheels fall off the cart. Um, so, is that something that you do at all in your practice in terms of, you know, measuring things like fasting insulin or what, or what type of uh, assessment yeah. would you recommend? Yeah, so as a trainer, I don't measure insulin yet because it, it's not really quite available. I'm going to be so excited the day that we get like a little handheld device that will measure uh, insulin just like we can do with blood glucose now. So I think there's a tendency with something that's easy and simple to measure that people put a little bit too much faith in that measurement. And if you're you know, a normal, healthy person and you've had you know, all your blood work done by your doc and all that looks good and you want to play around with a glucometer and see how you respond to different things, yeah, I think that's cool. I think that can be useful. But it annoys me when people go in, because I've referred to a, you know, a couple people that, I'm like, man, I just, you just have this sneaky feeling that something metabolically is just kind of whacked. 
and you go in and they do the one blood glucose measurement and they're just not technically over that line yet and the doc's like ah you know you're not technically a diabetic yet so don't worry about it you're like what <laughs> um so yeah i would at least like to see an a1c and if they're in that range i would love to see some insulin data just at least to see where they are at in that ballpark Um, because the other part too is that from looking at that data we were they were pulling bloods every like 10 minutes and there is a huge amount of variability from and this is you know lab measurements just from you know one 10 minute period to the next Um, so there's a fair amount of variability in those measurements that we don't really entirely appreciate yet but i would love to see just even if it's just one measurement of insulin, just to kind of see where you are in that spectrum. Because my feeling is that if you're borderline high blood glucose, your A1C is maybe a little bit borderline, I have a sneaky suspicion that your insulin may be much higher than we think because the insulin is doing its job, but we know that it's not going to be able to do that for a long period of time. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing how... You know, that type of client, the obese client, very overweight, um, obviously complaining of, of cravings and hunger. And yeah. I think it's tough for a lot of people to dissociate between, you know, they think they're hungry because their body needs fuel when, you know, we even know that somebody who's about 10% body fat probably has an excess of 25, 30,000 calories of energy, right? So kind of dissociating between that idea of need for fuel and just, just having cravings for craving sake, whether it's dysbiosis, whether it's low blood sugars, whether it's boredom. Um, do you manage that a little bit with your clients who are very overweight in terms of snacking, no snacking, certain types of things that you like to throw in there? Yeah, so a uh, quick side note on that, and I'll come back to that question. It's when you get stuck, I think, in the sort of blood glucose loop, and, you know, there's whole theories of how this is regulated from the, you know, like the glycostatic, you know, theory of metabolism, and, you know, some of that's been kind of sort of disproven, and it's not just one one theory we can hang our hat on. Like you said, it's it's multifactorial. Um, but I think, I think it was Peter Atia who mentioned once that, If you imagine you're driving down the road and you see like these huge, you know, tanker trucks that are full of gas and you find one on the side of the road that's pulled over because it ran out of gas, (laughs) you know, (laughs) it doesn't make any sense. You're like, oh, but the truck that's pulling it doesn't have access to this massive tank that it's, you know, taking to the gas station. So I kind of think of people like that where they have a fair amount of fat they can use, but they're having a harder time accessing it. So now you start pulling away, you know, the main fuel that they're used to, you know, they're going to have a little bit harder time uh, regulating that. Uh, So for me, how I think about it, my first thought is, can I get them to increase the ability to their body to use fat? And if you look at some studies that were done uh, primarily by the Gatorade Institute and some other areas, late 80s, early 90s, I, I was always fascinated by for just fat loss in general, sort of what's the rate limiting step, right? So what's if the one thing we could focus on, if there is one thing, how do we kind of get that going? And in general, there's what they call lipolysis, so your body's ability to, to liberate fat, to take it and to break it down, and there's fatty acid oxidation, so your body's ability to, in essence, burn fat as a fuel. And most of those studies kind of pretty clearly show that even in uh, overweight people, even in people with kind of a lot of metabolic issues, that lipolysis or the liberation of fat into the bloodstream to be burned isn't usually the rate-limiting step. It's usually the body's ability to burn it. Right, so kind of how big of a furnace you have to heat your house. You know, you've, you've got plenty of fuel floating around. It's just if you need more heat, you need a bigger furnace. And going down that pathway, I'm a bigger fan of using some periods of fasting. But in this population, I think you have to be pretty careful with that because they're extremely intolerant to it. So my preference is just to take one day a week, and I've done this in (laughs) healthy people too for performance reasons, and just push out breakfast by an hour or two, right? So if you always get up every morning at eight o'clock, you have your orange juice and your bagel, and you're absolutely hell bent on not changing that, you don't wanna add protein, you don't wanna do anything different, right? Because the other option is I'd have them substitute some type of protein for that. But a lot of people, it's a little habit thing, right? Oh, man, you know, I get up every morning and I have my bagel, my orange juice, and my coffee, and, you know, that's my morning breakfast all the time. 
I'm like, okay, so you can still have your morning breakfast, but instead of even at 8, could you eat it once a week at 9 or maybe even 10? So next Monday, could you have that at 10 o'clock? I don't care what you do the rest of the day. And most of the time, they're like, oh, you know, I can just wait a couple hours. Yeah, you know, I could probably do that. You know, then the following week, okay, could you push that out to lunch, right? So skip your normal lunch. You can still have your normal breakfast that you seem to be very attached to. Yeah, um, for sure. But you can have it at noon this time or 11. And so I just kind of progressively push everything out. And I usually won't change the meal that they seem to be most emotionally and physically attached to. Cause that's kind of their little, like, little booby, their little security blanket. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, and most people, you know, for about eight weeks or so, they can pretty easily do a, you know, 19-ish hour fast, um, which was pretty surprising to me. It was not as painful a process as I thought it would be. And the other part I like about it is it's very clear, right? You don't eat between this time or that time, you know? So like, well, could I put cream in my coffee? Like, well, no. Oh, but fat doesn't have an insulin release, and so I can put half a stick of butter in it? And like, no, just no calories, keep it simple. Um, and so I think that kind of black or white issue, which is very rare in nutrition stuff, I think helps them with compliance. And then I look at how do they feel at their first meal? If they feel like they're going to gnaw their arm off and they overeat, well, then obviously we went a little bit too far. You know, we'll, we'll pull it back a little bit. Um, so the reason for that I like too is that from a, a physiology sort of metabolic standpoint, is if I exclude exercise, because trying to get them to do exercise, that's a whole other argument, what is sort of the biggest metabolic hammer I can get to try to push their body's ability to use fat? And I think fasting does that real nicely, because when you fast, your insulin levels are going to go down lower and lower and lower. And healthy people, they'll kind of uh, bottom out at the bottom of that curve at around 18 hours. Um, yeah, metabolically deranged that may be a little bit longer. We don't have much data on that. So whatever level I can get them to that's lower, that's definitely going to push them further down that spectrum to upregulating the use of fat and upregulating all you know the enzymes and you know, everything from the mitochondrial and possibly biogenesis, all these other things. Um, and it appears to be works pretty well. The two caveats with that is that I think you have to make it very progressive. So the big mistake I, I did early on when I started doing this a while ago is I took healthy people and myself included, and I was used to eating every two to three hours, you know, the old, you know, high frequency back 10 years ago. And I said, okay, finally convinced myself after eight months of reading all the research that, okay, I'm going to do a fast Monday morning. Here I go, 24 hours. Um, I got about 14 hours into it, and I was hating life and hungry, and I think I destroyed two Chinese buffets at that point. And <laughs> Those 24-hour fasts are definitely, yeah, the, it's, uh, oh. it, it gets you kind of past that halfway point, doesn't it? Yeah, and it was brutal. I'm like, this is the stupidest thing ever. And then I realized, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I'm used to eating when I'm awake you know, every two to three hours. So it would be like someone coming into my gym, and they'd be like, hey, I've never deadlifted before. I'm like, that's okay. Let's start at 4.05. Exactly, you know, if exactly. you don't make it, I'll just yell at you to try harder. You know, <laughs> That's yeah, that key point of, yeah, just, just pushing people beyond their capacity, whether it's nutrition or training or whatnot. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a key yeah. part. Yeah. So unless you're Andy Bolton, the, the weight's probably not coming up on your, your first try. Um, so I think just keeping it progressive and, you know, anecdotally, it appears to work. There is more and more research coming out on that. There's uh, Dr. Verde has done a lot of stuff on alternate day fasting and other methods. And in general, although the research is pretty muddy in that area, it, compliance is usually pretty good, which that actually kind of surprised me. I was not expecting that. Yeah, I mean, I'm amazed. There's kind of two key parts there that you, you sort of touched on. One of them is that people sort of fail to realize that they wake up early in the morning or whatever, 6, 6, 37, they have their first bite of food. And typically they're snacking or eating all the way until their last bite on the couch at the end of the day. So the eating yeah. window becomes this like 18, 19 hour marathon. Um, so shrinking that is a really easy win, um, which like you mentioned is a great way to really improve that, that metabolic flexibility. And the other one, which you, you sort of touched on as well is even if we can either change that breakfast a little bit to reduce carbohydrate intake, or even sometimes with like an intermittent fasting style, almost remove that 
all those bad options completely. It's amazing how people find it's much easier than they think when at the outset they were almost thinking they might be, you know, chewing their arm off or nobody in their office is going to want to hang around them because they'll just be, you know, so irritable and in a bad mood, etc. Yeah, and the other cool part is that during that time, and I typically have them do it like once a week, they also realize that, oh, if I'm a little hungry, I'm not going to (laughs) die. And why am I hungry? Oh, wait a minute. I was hungry at 8, and now I don't eat again today until 2, but I wasn't hungry from 10 until 1. So sometimes I'll have them, you know, just record little notes. And I'm like, well, what were you doing between 10 and 1? Oh, you know, I was busy doing some work, doing some other stuff. Oh, so you kind of distracted yourself and you weren't that hungry. Yeah. So what does that kind of tell you about different cues you may have with with hunger? You know, you find a lot of times it's, you know, it's stress, it's habit. It's it's not as much of the, the physiologic hunger per se. I've even gone as far as to have people, you know, if they have... You know, one cupboard, they hide all the, the chocolate or cupcakes in, in the house or whatever. Just take a little post-it note and stick on the outside and then just write, are you hungry? So you have to ask yourself if you're actually hungry before you eat anything. And it's amazing, even just those small pattern interrupts for them to go, oh, no, I'm just doing this because I want something sweet. <laughs> exactly. That's <laughs> a I'm great like, That's a great cue because I think even in medicine, we're really bad. The medical community has really driven this home in people. Of like if you don't eat every three or four hours, you're just yeah. going to collapse and fall over and you know, yeah. into a heap on the sidewalk. Like it's really amazing how we've ingrained in people that they need to eat every three or four hours. And if they don't, bad things will happen. And like you mentioned, most people after 10 minutes realize that, oh, that, that sensation went away and now I'm, I'm off and running at my desk or – or whatnot. Yeah. Now, if we shift gears a little bit and, and go from someone who's an obese, very metabolically inflexible client, you know, 30, 40, 50 plus pounds to lose to maybe just an overweight client, you know, that 15 pounds or so um, whose insulin sensitivity is sort of, you know, moderate to maybe good. Where, where does that play in now in terms of the metabolic flexibility? Are there strategies around when they're not training or training that would, would help to enhance that, that fat burning capacity or flexi- metabolic flexibility? Yeah, so with that group, they're usually a little bit more uh, tolerant to do exercise, so I focus more on that with them. So I'm a big fan of just people getting up in the morning and just go for a fasted walk. Um, yeah, you know, you get into the whole fasted, you know, cardio is at the best for fat loss, and uh, you probably know Dr. Brad Schoenfeld's the only person who's done one chronic study looking yep. at that. Yep. And in that. And in that particular study, which, you know, all studies have limits, and it's one study, um, did not show any difference with that, um, but it was a pretty short study too. Um, but I do like them exercising at low intensity <clears throat> in a fasted state. Um, also for the mental benefits, most people just feel a lot better, you know, purely anecdotally, but they do appear to be make better decisions during the day about food. They appear to be a little bit less stressed, and you're actually tapping in a little bit to the body's use of fat as a fuel. Terrific. And then on the other end of the spectrum, and it's usually easy, right? Just get up, walk out your door. I oh, think, okay, I could do that. That's part of the <laughs> appeal, isn't it? Like the easiness of some of these things. I think sometimes that's what we miss in some of the studies of the other habits that it dovetails into of people not being afraid to not eat anything, go for a walk, or do some light activity. So that's that's a that's a great point. Yeah. And on the other end of the spectrum then, so that's kind of a little bit on the, the fat metabolism side. And on the other end, for weight training, I'm a big fan of having them consume some type of carbohydrate uh, pre and possibly post. If I had a choice, I would definitely do it more pre. Uh, Reason for that is that that is going to push up insulin levels, and that's actually what we want. We want to drive the body to use more carbohydrates at that point. Uh, Most people generally report that they feel better, RPE on exercise, so rating of perceived exertion uh, usually goes down a little bit. Um, and I think that in that group, they tend to not look at performance during exercise. Gotcha. They tend to be very fatigue orientated. Oh man, you know, I went to the gym and oh, they just crushed me and that was great. And I left and I crawled <laughs> out of there on, you know, one leg and I hopped to my car and it was I'm awesome. Like, okay. Well, that may be okay. But you know, how did you do? Like, what did you do? Have you... You know, if you do this week in and week out, you know, week nine, are you doing more than you did in week one? I'm 
I'm not sure. But week nine, man, I left. I was destroyed. <laughs> and I think that's a great point for trainers out there listening as well because sometimes they get, you know, whether you're so busy and so many clients or whatever else, but sometimes weeks can fly by. And, like, are you looking back to make sure if you're doing that type of training with your client, like, are they actually fitter or are you just – annihilating them through every session you know i mean that's uh but you prefer to have that pre uh carbohydrate for that group now is there like a you know piece of fruit or um just starchy carb or what What are some of your go-tos there yeah so i'd like to use a little bit higher um gi index which uh, i don't know if i trust the gi index anymore but i do find that that just from a pure digestion standpoint tends to go better with them yep uh, so like spotted banana, some you know, instant oatmeal or rice cereal, you know, things of that nature that are, you know, pretty easily digestible. You know, if they're in a real big hurry, I'll have them use like a whey protein and something like the Targo. So some type of carbohydrate that's kind of rapidly absorbed. Yeah. I mean, I've had people even just, you know, drink that on their way walking to the gym and 20 minutes later, they're fine. Yeah. You know, so a lot of times it's, it's more of a convenience. Um, if you're using whole food, which I definitely like. You're looking at more, for most people, yeah, 90-ish minutes, probably an hour and a half, somewhere around there before, sometimes an hour, you know, and it, it all varies. You know, some people can eat a whole bunch, go lift, and they're fine. Other people can't eat for two hours or they just feel nauseous. Yeah. That's a little bit on how they, how they feel. And then I have them track their performance, and most people tend to do better at that uh, point. And then also most people we forget. So if we look at all the studies on timing, you can go back and forth about arguing about is there a timing effect or not. But people forget that in the timing studies, right? So the classic study when the first one's done was by Paul Cribb. So they had a creatine, carbohydrate, and protein solution. One group got that bracketed before and after training. The other group got the exact same solution in the morning and at night. So in the timing studies, you're only looking at timing. So the macronutrients are the same, the calories are the same, everything else is the same. Because from a research standpoint, you want to know if we only alter timing, does that really matter? Again, on that, the research is pretty split. But in the real world, if I tell someone, okay, before you do your weight training session, I want you to have about you know 20 to 30 grams of protein, 40 to 80 grams of carbohydrates um, before, and at least just get some protein in afterwards. That's usually an additive process, meaning that they probably ate breakfast, maybe they ate lunch, and typically wouldn't have not eat anything until they got home for dinner at 6.30 after their last training session. Gotcha. All right, so by adding something in at say five, you're actually getting more protein, you're getting more carbs, they're probably gonna use them pretty effectively because they're going to train. So we're actually alternating they're changing macros, calories, and timing. Um, so we're not necessarily playing purely with a, a timing effect. And I also know if I can get them even just a little bit better performance over time, that that is a pretty good investment. And then even if I have to kind of trim calories from other places, I'll, I'll normally do that because I want to keep the performance of their training as high as possible. That's a great, uh, great take home, especially for that overweight group that's, you know, 15 pounds or so that that performance in the gym is really going to kick off a lot of the, uh, the fat burning effects. Can you walk us through kind of some quick highlights on that, on the uh, physiological side of, you know, for trainers out there, you know, what are the benefits that we're going to accomplish if we can get our overweight clients training with a bit more intensity or improving that, that fitness levels? Yeah, I'm, I'm just a big fan in general of expansion and not contraction. And yeah, I totally understand that, you know, calories in, calories out, all that stuff matters. But the average client is just thinking, okay, how can I cut and reduce and restrict everything as much as possible? And their thought process normally going into even weight training is how can I turn this into some type of bastardized circuit training so I can burn more fat? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like, well, I would rather have people do more fasted, lower intensity aerobic stuff to specifically target, you know, fat use than I would a weight training session. So the weight training session, I want them to do more work on, you know, hypertrophy and strength. So we know that long term, the more muscle they can keep, especially as they get older with sarcopenia, muscle loss, or even gain, that while that is a small amount, if we only look at sort of the calories burned from it, but I think we underappreciate the metabolic health and just having a bigger sink to get rid of glucose and all these 
high excursions are probably going to run into. And keeping that stimulus as close to that as possible, so use carbohydrates, probably take a little bit longer rest period. Um, I've even put heart rate monitors on people to say, okay, you're not doing your next set of, say, bench press until your heart rate gets to at least 90 beats per minute, right? Because yep. women in general want to make everything a, a circuit training type thing. Yep, for sure. Which is fine if that's your goal is circuit training, right? Um, so, yeah, that's my bias there to keep that as sort of pure as possible because um, I want the stimulus for muscle to be as high as possible. So, and there's ranges of what kind of results they'll get from that. But from a trainer's perspective, the only thing you can really directly control is how you're putting together that stimulus for that person. You can't necessarily control that, oh, wow, this person's an extreme responder and they look at a press down machine and their triceps get bigger. You know, oh boy, this other person had to do a lot of work. Uh, they didn't get quite the same result, <clears throat> but the stimulus, what you're putting in is what you can actually control. And, and then I explained to clients too that just it's very empowering to look at stuff that you can do more of. So for even example, like my mom finally just started weight training probably six months ago. She's 68. And awesome. she texted me the other day that she's working out with friends of mine in Alexandria, Minnesota at Newton Sports, and that she did uh, trap bar deadlifts with 135 for five reps. Fantastic. Was, That's awesome. You know, and when she started, she wasn't doing trap bar deadlifts, and the first time she did them, she was at 95 pounds, and that was pretty cool, you know. So I think it's very empowering for clients to see that they're actually making progress in that area. And then it's like if I told you, okay, don't think of a pink elephant. The brain is wired visually, so your first thought is you visualize the pink elephant, right? Even though I, I told you, don't think of the pink elephant, right? So it's like, you know, don't eat this, don't do this, don't do that. We tend to kind of wire ourselves visually for that. Sort of like when, um, the, gol- when the golfer says, don't hit it in the water, and that's yeah, almost assuredly right where it's going. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's like the worst thing you could say to someone at that point. Um, so I like to tell people, okay, here's what I want you to do. So over time, if we look at your training program, I expect you to be stronger. I expect you to have a little bit more muscle mass. I expect you to be able to do more volumes of work, better density, higher loads. And again, this is over months to possibly years. Uh, Nutrition-wise, I like to see, okay, can you eat more protein? Can you eat more vegetables? Can you get more micronutrition? And, and by doing those things, you know, a lot of times you kind of push out all the other stuff, which works much better than telling someone, hey, dude, just, just stop eating Oreos. Exactly. I mean, that's a great take home for, for trainers as well, that idea of expansion rather than contraction. And, and just like you mentioned, kind of layering in these habits um, and sort of getting there through the back door, if you will, of, of, cre- of getting the achieving what you want, but without having to tell people don't eat this, don't eat that or, or just eat less type of uh, approach. So now, Mike, if we shift gears here in the last little section of the interview here um, towards athletes and this idea of yeah. metabolic flexibility in particular, I see a lot of endurance athletes uh, here in downtown Toronto. Um you know, high level ones, ones are just recreational ones. And we get a lot of, let's call them carboholics on the, on the endurance mm-hmm. training side, which, which obviously has its performance benefits. Can, but can you talk us through a little bit of uh, how that might impact various athletes? Yeah, it's very fascinating because like uh, running a marathon is the, the big one that comes up a lot, right? And you see people argue back and forth for that. So if I'm working with, and I don't work with a ton of endurance athletes, I've worked with a handful. The first question I'll ask them is someone comes in and goes, hey, I want to run a marathon. Cool, that's awesome. Why do you want to run a marathon? Oh, it's just a very cool sense of accomplishment. Okay, cool. Are you doing it for any body composition reasons? And most of the time after him and Hahn, most people will generally say, well, yeah, I do want to lose some weight. So to me, that's extremely different than an Olympic level athlete comes in and goes, yeah, I want to get better, you know, at the Olympic trials this year for a marathon, right? So the average person who just wants to finish, I think will be a little bit better off trying to get their body to use fat better as a fuel source. Uh, they're also looking for kind of secondary body compositions. Uh, that also benefits if, you know, they miss a, a feeding station or whatever. And, you know, just from a pure metabolic health of getting their body to upregulate the use of fat. However, if you look at someone who's running an Olympic time or in that range marathon, eh, 
maybe that might benefit them a little bit, but their race is almost entirely fueled by carbohydrates to a high degree because they're running really freaking fast. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Even though it's a marathon, comparatively speaking, they are running extremely fast. So if you look at the studies that's done on that group of people, it is mostly almost all carbohydrates. Um, I would make an argument, though, that that may be costing them from a metabolic health standpoint. For sure, that idea but, of you know, performance and health not necessarily being right, on the same road, right? Right. So now, my you, bias is if they're not at an elite level, I do like to have them train for some period of time, just trying to get the use of fat as high as possible. The caveat with that is that I do not want to compromise their ability to use carbohydrates, though. And I really don't want to see their times drop that much. Gotcha. So if they're doing long duration, you know, tempo runs, long, slow distance, I will prioritize those mostly and titrate carbs back to get that to be primarily fasted without compromising the time or the pace that they want to hit for that. And then their faster runs, those would be all fueled by carbohydrates as much as I can cram down their throat. <laughs> Great. So I, I do want to see them have at least a little bit of balance because, again, everything ends up being extreme, right? The, the average person reads that and goes, oh, Joe Bob is an Olympic-level runner. They take carbohydrates in all the time. Woohoo! I'm going to have you know carbohydrates, screw protein, screw fat. And I just think that that is going to make them generally very sensitive to that. So if you start removing that a little bit or they miss a station, uh, whether it's mental, physiologically, whatever – they tend to have all sorts of issues. And what happens if they take in the wrong type of carbohydrate? Now they've got GI distress and, yep. you know, all those things just kind of muddies the water pretty fast. And do you see in the on that performance side, if we shift gears to even an event like uh, cycling where, you know, the athlete's mm -hmm. going to be sat down for longer, um, on the performance end, do you see some benefits there with, with this idea of becoming more fat adapted and, and creating a, taking advantage of, of more of that aerobic uh, capacity there on the fat burning side? I think so. That's, again, that's my bias dependent upon the athlete, right? So if someone comes to me and they've got a pretty low level of just an aerobic base and they're kind of more of an anaerobic monster, in pretty much every case, increasing that aerobic base has a benefit to them, usually in their ability to recover from one training session to the next. That may not necessarily make them faster on their sprints or their high output stuff, but if they could take, and let's say they can only do two really high output sessions a week, and we could add another session to that with only eight weeks of work, that's pretty cool, right? Because now you're looking at that's a fair amount more high quality sessions that may be more transferred to their goal over the course of a year and we're improving their metabolic health. To me, that's a pretty good trade off. Absolutely. The hard part, again, is that everyone is you know, sort of bipolarized and it's even a word, one direction or the other, right? You've got the group that's like, no, no, you know, the Olympic level runners, they're only using carbs, screw fat. Don't ever worry about it. And then you've got the other people that are like, oh, man, if you're just in a ketogenic state the entire time and you can just upregulate fat as high as possible, you'll be fine. But we know that if we throw ketones out of the equation for now, that fat cannot provide the same level of power as carbohydrates just from a pure bioenergetic standpoint. Um, so I'm a fan of, well, let's just use both, right? You know, if you've got an athlete who's doing very low intensity aerobic base building work, they don't really need a lot of carbohydrates for that. It's not a high enough intensity to require that. Even though they may have wired their physiology to be like that, I think if we could get the exact same performance, so one thing I'll measure is have them do just a set amount of work, and then I'll slowly start removing carbohydrates from it. And over even eight weeks, if their performance stayed exactly the same, but they could go out and do that completely fasted, cool. I know that their body must be using fat more effectively. You can get into you know, arguments about, well, you know, they had stored glycogen, they didn't, blah, 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 whatever. You can glycogen, you know, deplete them the day before and then have them run. You can get into the, you know, train low, compete high, all yep. that kind of stuff. Yep. Um, but in general, I just, if you think real simply, how can I upregulate the use of fat to the highest degree possible? 
without compromising their ability to use carbohydrates. So strategically, I'll use more fasting than I will necessarily higher fat periods. Um, so if you look at people put on like a ketogenic type diet, super high fat, it can screw with like the PDH enzyme changes that then kind of inhibit your body to completely use carbohydrates to the full degree. Gotcha. So if you take someone who's let's say, oh man, I'm upregulating my use of fat. I've been in you know ketosis for four months. And before this big race, I'm just going to put all my carbohydrates back. Boom, I'll be metabolically flexible. I'll use both and it'll be amazing. Not that and simple, right? No. A lot of, <laughs> a lot of those people fall on their face. Well, it's because interesting too because they lost the ability to fully use carbs. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's a really great take home point. It's, I was just going to add there. It's interesting how ancestrally in places like France, if you go back, you know, decades and decades, you know, getting up in the morning, having a couple of espressos and going for some of these longer yeah. more intensity rides was just kind of what they did. And very common before mountain rides, they would have a bigger, you know, lunch meal and go out. So it was almost, uh, you know, without knowing perhaps what they were really doing there in the, you know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, it's, it's, it's a very similar uh, approach there. Now, if we shift gears to kind of a specific population, you know, I deal primarily with a lot of basketball players and of course mm -hmm. you've got ectomorph, you know, body types and a highly glycolytic uh, sport. So yeah. in terms of more of these team sports, and if we use basketball as an example, what are your, you know, what are your thoughts there, obviously, in terms of this balance between fats and carbs or finding that, that magical, you know, golden spot there for athletes? Yeah, so it's, it's pretty similar. So when they're doing like uh, their high glycolytic output stuff, I like that to primarily be fueled by carbohydrates. Um, lower, you know, low intensity practices or lower uh, aerobic based type work, I primarily like to have fasted. The one monkey wrench that I will throw in that with uh, individual or team sports that tend to be more on the glycolytic side is I don't want them mentally to be so reliant upon that that if something weird happens, they can't perform. Right. Yeah. So, for example, if if they're used to always having their favorite carbohydrate drink before every single game or high intensity practice, yeah, I think that's good. But at some point, I'd say that's like a use stress model. So stress that they're used to, they're pretty happy there. But at some point, I will slowly or abruptly remove that and make sure that they can still perform, right? So from an energetic standpoint, if your glycogen levels are topped off, right, and you, let's say, do a workout at noon and you haven't eaten then, you should probably do pretty fine. And in my experience, mental issues aside, people do just fine, yep. right? Because your body's primarily pulling muscle glycogen. You know, liver glycogen is going to be a little bit low from the overnight fast, but it's primarily muscle glycogen that's fueling that activity. But where you get the hang up is that their success has been mentally associated to them consuming whatever their favorite carbohydrate drink, right? Like, oh, they got to use their favorite socks before every game. Exactly, exactly. The <laughs> um, mental side. Yep. So I do want them to be able to perform without that. And so I will do that in practice very carefully to make sure that they still perform well, right? So some weird thing happens around the road or, or God knows whatever happens. They don't have their little magical carb powder. You just go, oh, remember that one day we, we actually practiced this in training where we purposely did not have any carbohydrates and you know, our performance was great. Oh, oh, okay, okay, I'll be all right, I'll be all right. It's just one game, don't worry about it. You know, so that they can kind awesome. of yeah, have something to go back to because otherwise they, they'd end up down this, you know, mental downward spiral of, oh, I need this, this is going to be horrible. and <laughs> Negative self-talk and then it all starts, yep. the wheels start to fall off the car. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Awesome, Mike. This is such uh, such amazing stuff.